SmackDown was sold out tonight in San Antonio, Texas. WWE's hot streak continues. They're constantly having to open up new sections in all these buildings. What is going on? My God. They're sold out for Crown Jewel. Michael Cole was on commentary tonight saying, don't worry, we're going to try to open up more sections for the show, even in Saudi Arabia. But speaking of Saudi Arabia, it was made official earlier today. Pretty much we could figure it out from last week's show that the main event for Crown Jewel coming up in Riyadh on November 4th will in fact be Roman Reigns defending the undisputed WWE Championship against LA Knight. So they are not wasting any time putting LA Knight in the ring right in the hot seat, challenging for the championship in just a few weeks. And there was no Roman Reigns on the show tonight, but LA Knight was there. He didn't do much. He did deliver some words to Paul Heyman. Uh, but we are getting the contract signing on SmackDown next week. The show is being bumped to FS1. I believe next Friday's show is actually the final show. Uh, before is, is it next week? No, I'm sorry. It's in two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, because Crown Jewel is after Halloween. I'm speeding this month. Uh, I, I want to get to Halloween as quickly as possible. So I'm actually I'm eliminating weeks from the month on the calendar. So you'll have to excuse me. But that contract signing is coming up next week. The main event tonight was for the WWE Women's Championship. It was Io Sky defending her title against Charlotte Flair. And this was the, not only the longest match of the night, well, I'm going to talk about the, the amount of wrestling we had on this show tonight. Uh, but it was the best match on the entire show. They had a very good main event. We do not have a new women's champion, thankfully. Her name is still Io Sky. She is still the women's champion. I did enjoy the finish to the match especially because of what it reminded me of. I will tell you what it reminded me of when we get to the match a little bit later on, but the other story came when the match was over, because as Charlotte Flair was being ganged up on by damage control, she was saved by the returning Bianca Belair, making her first appearance on TV in over two months. Uh, Bianca came back tonight. 
She cleared the ring of all the heels. She helped Charlotte Flair to her feet. And now it becomes clear to me where this has gone. Looking into the future and I see exactly where this story is headed. We'll talk about that. John Cena on the show tonight. Not the only person teasing retirement this week. We got the announcement from Sting the other night on Dynamite that he will be retiring at Revolution 2024, weeks shy of his 65th birthday. So as we prepare to bid farewell to Sting, John Cena was in the ring tonight teasing that he too has retirement on the brain. But he also pointed out a statistic that was pretty amazing, and I, I didn't even believe it at first. But he pointed out a pretty amazing statistic about his win-loss record over the past several years. And now it looks like uh, he may have an opponent himself at Crown Jewel. He has not been announced yet for the Saudi Arabia show, but I find it hard to believe that he won't have a match on that show. Jay Uso made a cameo tonight, even though he is on Monday Night Raw. Jay Uso lost. The undisputed tag team titles, if you were with me the other night, we talked about that. The loss, Cody and Jay going down to the Judgment Day, thanks to Jimmy Uso. And so Jay Uso returned the favor, went after his brother on the show tonight, and that led to a very interesting exchange backstage between our two general managers. Now, why the Raw GM was on SmackDown tonight, that was never explained. But they were face-to-face, -face and we got a little tease for War Games. Still no announcement. We got a little tease for some games coming up at Survivor Series. And Logan Paul was back. First time that we have seen Logan Paul here on WWE television in several months. He was here to call out Rey Mysterio. They had a face-to-face. -face. Their match is now official for Crown Jewel. They will be wrestling for the United States Championship. And I will say, even though I enjoyed the show tonight, I thought it was a good episode of SmackDown. They move the key stories along as we go into not only Crown Jewel, but Survivor Series. Again, I love Nick Aldis in the role of SmackDown GM. Uh, he was briefly on the show tonight. You know, they didn't overexpose him. There's still time for them to do that. But I have to mention this. We were through the first 90 minutes of the show tonight. And in the first 90 minutes of a show called SmackDown, we had barely 15 minutes of actual wrestling. And even though I enjoyed the show overall, you can't have under 15 minutes of wrestling in the first 90 minutes of this show. I'm sorry. I don't care if it's Vince McMahon in charge. I don't care if it's Triple H in charge. You know, at least Triple H did a good job of keeping the show interesting. Uh, but I don't care who you are. I don't care who's running the show, who's booking this stuff. It has to be called out. Now, they gave us a 15-plus minute main event, which was good, but still, come on, sub-15 minutes of wrestling in the first 90 is ridiculous. But we're going to talk about this whole show tonight because this is your Friday Night SmackDown review for October 20th, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. We're shooting tonight for at least 415 likes on this video. Why? Because I said so. 415 is the goal. Maybe we'll do Be the Booker later. Maybe we won't. That's up to you guys. Super Chats are open, including some new ones. You can check out the description down below if you want to know what those are. Even Bree has been updated for Halloween. Now, Paul Heyman, the walrus himself, he was in the ring with a microphone in his hand all by himself. No other Bloodline members with him. He was in the ring to... Talk to us, as many people did on this show tonight. Talk to us here. He said that he's got some really big shoes to fill for the bloodline this week. He said, did you see what Jimmy did on Raw Monday night? Hey, Brian, I got to cut in here to thank Brian. Brian Musha just dropped five gifted memberships on us in the live chat. Brian, I know, is celebrating a birthday this weekend, so... I'm going to mention it again on Sunday, but Brian, happy birthday. Thank you for the memberships. And welcome to all of our new members. So he asked us if we saw what Jimmy did on Raw. He said that Jimmy called the play. He used the motivation and inspiration of Roman Reigns to cost Jay Uso and Cody Rhodes the undisputed tag team titles. Then he put over the announcement in the LA Times earlier today. Yes, the Los Angeles Times. They had the LA Times break the news about LA Knight 
going to Saudi Arabia to challenge Roman Reigns at Crown Jewel for the Undisputed Championship. And Paul said that he he's like every one of us, except they're from Texas and he's from New York. He dresses better than them. He makes more money than they do. But he did say that he has some commonality with the, uh, the poor folk here in the crowd of the poors, as MJF would say. He says, we're all big fans of L.A. Knight. He says, if you're a fan of him like I am, you must watch Crown Jewel because it will be the last time that you will see L.A. Knight inside the ring. That night, L.A. Knight is going to get smashed by Roman Reigns, which can be taken multiple ways. I guess that appeals to different audiences, to each their own. So then L.A. Knight's music plays, and here he comes down to the ring. Takes the mic away from Paul Heyman. He tells Paul he can take a walk because Roman is the one that he wants to talk to. So Heyman goes to leave the ring. L.A. Knight turns around and says, hey, where do you think you're going? Get back in the ring. So he threatens to hit Paul if he tries to leave the ring again. He says, the word on the streets is that the spear last week at the end of the show was a warning. And he asks Heyman if uh, that was really the right move. He says he doesn't do warning shots because he'll just keep coming. Which, again, could be taken multiple ways. He says he's like Michael Myers. Doesn't matter how many times you knock him down, he's going to keep getting up, keep coming back. He says he won't stop until he owns Roman in this ring and he owns the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. He says that if Roman is scared, then say he's scared. He says Roman should be because he hasn't seen anyone like LA Knight before. As fast as he's risen, that's how fast, which again could be taken so many ways. I mean, I'm on a roll here tonight. My God, I didn't realize all the double entendres here in this segment. Holy shit. Give SmackDown a whole new meaning. As fast as he has risen, that is how fast he will take the title from Roman Reigns. He says that contract signing next week, which was the first mention of a contract signing anywhere. Apparently, we're getting a contract signing next week. He says that will take place right here in this ring. He says if Roman... <laughs> Speaking of double entendres. Hey, Chris Miner, thank you for the 15 bucks. I will stuff it in Nia's hole and keep it there. It would be safe, safekeeping there. Until the end of the show. He says, if Roman isn't going to be here now, you'll be on the phone with him. Tell Roman that it's clear whose game this is. And when Roman looks at you with that befuddled look on his face, he says, make sure you speak the undisputed truth. And that is L.A. Knight. The Knight slammed the microphone into Heyman's chest. He walked out of the ring to close out the segment. And Paul pulled out his phone and he mouthed to his phone, Paul Roman Reigns. You know, Sid, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I feel like I'm the only podcast out there that doesn't do any advertising for Blue Chew. And yet here I am every single week. It just feels like we're, this is all we're doing here. He's talking about sex. <laughs> I was talking about TJ Maxx the other night. What's going on? Hey, Blue Chew. What's going on here? Look at me. I'm literally wearing blue. The entire screen is blue. Where's Blue Chew at? So this was nothing blow away from either man. I mean, LA Knight was good, but nothing blow away from either. <laughs> from either man. Uh, but I thought it was effective in setting up next week's contract signing. Obviously, they didn't have Roman Reigns on the show tonight. So there's only so much you can do when the champion is not present, as he has not been for most of the summer and fall so far. But I thought it was effective in setting up the segment for next week. And, you know, when, when they made the announcement earlier today, and WWE tweeted this out about the uh, match for Crown Jewel, LA Knight getting a championship match, I mentioned it was a year ago, this month, that LA Knight got his name back. He, he shed the skin of Max Dupree. He was once again LA Knight. And he was on this show. He was on SmackDown almost a year to the day. Wrestling Mansoor. That is what LA Knight was doing a year ago. Fast forward a year, and now he's going to Saudi Arabia to wrestle Roman Reigns in the main event for the WWE Championship. 
that doesn't happen if Vince McMahon sticks around and doesn't leave when he did a year ago. This doesn't happen if there isn't a change at the top in the creative hierarchy in WWE if Vince McMahon does not get phased out and Triple H does not gain some measure of creative power. LA Knight is doing something else, but he sure as hell isn't wrestling Roman Reigns for the WWE Championship. A lot can change in a year, a lot has changed in a year, and there is no single person on this roster who has been a greater beneficiary of Vince McMahon being shuffled off to the side than L.A. Knight, even more than Gunther. Because as I've pointed out before, Gunther was the Intercontinental Champion just before Vince stepped aside last summer. He was getting a push no matter what. Now, would Gunther be in the position he's in now, having these great matches on TV, longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time? Maybe not. But in my opinion, there is no single person on this roster who has been a bigger beneficiary of Triple H ascending to power creatively and Vince McMahon stepping aside and being preoccupied with other things than LA Knight. And so you love to see it. So now the question is, what happens when he loses? Right? What happens when LA Knight goes all the way to Riyadh and he does not win the WWE Championship? Because LA Knight is not winning the title. I love LA Knight. I'm glad he's finally getting his big break, but he is not winning the title. He could take solace in the fact that Cody Rhodes was another popular babyface who got beat by Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. He got screwed out of the championship by the bloodline. And Cody Rhodes has been able to maintain his popularity. Cody Rhodes is still doing okay. Cody Rhodes is going to WrestleMania next year, and he will get his rematch with Roman Reigns. So. If you have LA Knight get screwed at Crown Jewel out of the championship, all is not lost. He is not buried. He is not finished. He'll be fine. I mean, look, you saw the face-off between Cody and Roman on television last week. It was brief. But there was a buzz in the crowd. They took that face-off, by the way. They put that on YouTube. So it was a video of a face-to-face -face confrontation. There was no match. There was no pushing. There was no shoving. There was no physicality. Over a million views on YouTube for a face-off between Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is going to be just fine. LA Knight is going to be just fine as well. Of course, the key, though, is what you do with him coming out of Crown Jewel. We are heading into Survivor Series. It is very likely that we are getting a War Games match. And L.A. Knight should be a part of that War Games match. He should be on the babyface side of things. And honestly, whether it was a War Games match or it was a traditional Survivor Series elimination match, old school style, he's going to be on the side of the babyfaces. He's going to be on Team Cody or whatever, whatever the team ends up being. And so L.A. Knight will be fine. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm happy for him. For him to be in the position that he's in, if you would have said that a year ago, very few people would have believed you, that he would be where he is right now. We had Santos Escobar, one-on-one -on -one against Montez Ford. Santos with a super kick, he sends Ford out to the floor and then hits a suicide dive. Escobar sets up for the running double knee strike, hits it in the corner, and he goes for the phantom driver, Ford escapes. Ford escapes. I swear that wasn't on purpose. Ford gets sent to the apron. He kicks Escobar uh, from the apron. And now Santos with an enziguri. And he goes up top for a Frankensteiner. Hits the move. Dawkins pulls Ford out to safety on the floor. And Escobar with a uh, slingshot. <laughs> now this is the part where I just sort of, uh, I cringed a little bit. Because Escobar goes for a sledge. Out to the floor. Slingshot double sledge. And he completely misses. Ford just, he did, just didn't move. So he didn't get touched really. He didn't sell the move. Escobar looked like he just hit a flying nothing out to the floor. So yeah, it was a botch. It didn't look good. Santos sends Ford back into the ring. But Dawkins then shoves Escobar face first into the ring post. Here comes Joaquin Wild and uh, Cruz del Toro. They go after Dawkins. Dawkins sends Cruz into the ring steps. Here comes Escobar, though. And he nails Dawkins with a running knee strike. 
Back into the ring he goes, and Montez Ford gets a roll up and the three count while hooking the tights. So this is part of that heel turn, the new attitude of the Street Profits, something you would not have seen them doing before. Uh, this is what Bobby Lashley wanted to see, right? So again, the evolution of the Street Profits continues here. And Montez Ford picks up the win. After the match was over, Ford and Dawkins, they attacked Santos. And Carlito makes his way to the ring with a chair to make the save and clear, clear house. I am renewing my objections to this new theme music that Carlito is using. It is terrible. Give him back his old music. I will renew my objections indefinitely until they do so. Backstage. Rey Mysterio walked up to Carlito. Hey, there's the father of the year. Christian Cage. Your father of the year. Backstage, Rey Mysterio walks up to Carlito and the rest of the LWO. Tells them that uh, they're always family. He's got his confrontation tonight with Logan Paul, since Logan Paul is going to be on the show. Zelina Vega asks him if he wants them out there as backup when Logan calls him out. Ray says, no, I got to go out there and do this on my own. And he thanked them all. Escobar kind of looked maybe like he was frustrated with him. Then we got a video package highlighting the big win that Pretty Deadly got over the Brawling Brutes on TV last week. And we got a vignette. Pretty Deadly were at the spa. They were getting a spa treatment. They were getting a pedicure. They were bragging about their victory and how they would never have to see the Brawling Brutes ever again. You can imagine what happened next. They showed up at the salon. They dunked them face first in the water that their feet were soaking in. And then Ridge and Butch decided, let's go grab a pint. And they left. Backstage, Jimmy Uso walked into the Bloodline locker room where Paul Heyman and Solo Sokoa were, and he was bragging. He was calling, you know, what he did on Monday a successful play, right? I called the play. You saw what I did. I cost Cody and Jay the undisputed tag team titles. Paul Heyman, though, he was pointing at the TV because he saw something that bothered him, and then we saw what he was looking at. It was John Cena who arrived at the building. He was walking through the backstage area, getting ready to come out to the ring for the next segment. That did take us into the next segment, which was John Cena, billed as he is every single week, as the greatest of all time. That's part of his name now. That, that literally is like part of his name on the show. You cannot have the ring announcer say John Cena without first calling him the greatest of all time. It's part of the marketing gimmick now. So the greatest of all time, John Cena makes his way down to the ring. And he is very humbled by all the chants of thank you, Cena, that he is showered with. Again, it's, it is it is amazing as time goes on. And I think people get very nostalgic and, and people get older. Cena, you know, he, he came back for this run. It's not going to last that much longer. We don't get to see him very often uh, anymore outside of this run. And so people have learned to appreciate John Cena a lot more than they did 10 years ago. When he was getting... He was getting other chants, not chants of thank you, Cena. He was getting very different chants at that time. So he looked genuinely humbled by it. He said last week he came out and he talked about Roman Reigns' streak, which at the time was 1,138 days. I think now it's 1,147 days. As the undisputed WWE Universal Champ. Well, he said he found out that he has a streak of his own. 2,002 days. 2,002 days is what it has been since he last won a televised singles match. He said his last singles win on television in WWE was in 2018. And when he, when he said it, I didn't believe it at first, but it is true. It's been over five years since John Cena got a singles win on TV. This man has been buried. Can you believe it? What a jobber. What a jabron. Five years, he hasn't been able to pick up a win. So he got emotional. He said that he's been uh, talking a whole lot about retirement. And people started to boo. I'm thinking, come on now, Sting and John Cena in the same week? I mean, we can't have that. He said, it's time we all face facts. 
Fact is, it's been a long time since he's had a win. And the fans chanted, you still got it. And then he suddenly got very animated. He went from being very quiet and solemn and emotional. He got very animated and very loud. And he said he believes in this. He believes that he can still go, and that he can still bring it. And he believes that the time is now to turn the math around. So here's the fact. It is going to be a bad night for the next idiot brave enough to walk through that curtain. Because whoever it is, they are going to get smoked. And he pulled off his hat. Pulled off his shirt, he was ready for a fight, and out comes Solo Sokoa of the Bloodline. He comes down to the ring, and they go at it. Cena even gave him a stinger splash in the corner, which I thought was kind of funny, actually. Given that we were, in the same week, here we are talking about John Cena teasing the idea of retirement. In the same week that Sting literally announced his retirement, and here's Cena giving a stinger splash in the corner to Solo Sokoa. And I, again, I don't know if that was an intentional thing, if that was, you know, the connection that uh, we were supposed to make or not. But uh, that was not lost on me. But here comes Jimmy Uso to the ring, and Jimmy Uso gives him a super kick that did not connect. It was about a foot away from his face, Cena sold it anyway. Suddenly a hooded man dressed in all black, perhaps one of the men who uh, laid a beat down on Jay White on Dynamite several weeks ago, one of the ninjas, I don't know. Uh, but he pulls Jimmy Uso, this person pulls Jimmy out to the floor, and then the hooded man reveals himself to be Jay Uso, who got a huge reaction, a mega reaction from the crowd when he pulled down his, his mask. And so this was revenge for Jimmy super kicking him on Monday night and costing him and Cody the undisputed tag team titles. He attacked Jimmy, super kicked him over the timekeeper's barricade. Jimmy was calling time out, trying to beg off. Security came over. They were holding Jay back. They hauled him away. Meanwhile, back in the ring, Sokoa went for a Samoan spike to John Cena, but he stuffed it. He got Solo up on his shoulders, and he hit the attitude adjustment. They played his music as Jimmy and Solo retreated back up the aisle. Now, if you were watching this segment, you would think that they were setting up for a tag team match at Crown Jewel. That's going to be John Cena and Jay Uso against Jimmy Uso and Solo Sokoa. And I will tell you, that match does nothing for me. I'm sure the fans in Saudi Arabia would love it. If Paul, if uh, Paul, if John Cena is on the show, they're going to love it no matter what, if he actually makes it to Riyadh. But to me, how do you, how do you do Cena and Jey Uso against Solo and Jimmy when you just had John Cena come out and talk about 2002 days since he last won a singles match, and then you don't give us a John Cena singles match? The match at Crown Jewel, if Cena's wrestling on that show, is John Cena, one-on-one, -on -one, with Solo Sokoa. That should be the match. And Cena wins his first match in five years. His first singles match in five years. So that's that, that to me, is, is what would make the most sense. But again, he's not yet confirmed, I don't think, for the uh, Saudi show. But again, when he mentioned that statistic, it caught me off guard because it just sounded ridiculous. And yeah, I looked it up, and sure enough, not only was the last singles win for John Cena way back in 2018, it actually happened. It, it came against Triple H, and it happened on the very first show that they ever did in Saudi Arabia, the Greatest Royal Rumble, the same night that Braun Strowman won the big green ugly belt that night. So that was the first Saudi show, and that's the last time John Cena won a singles match in WWE. And 2002 also, it was not lost on me, was the same year that he debuted, which is kind of eerie. But how about that pop for Jey Uso? Cannot stress enough how big of a reaction he got uh, just coming out and pulling down the mask. I mean, and, and the people just, they exploded. They, you know, they went crazy for him. And it occurred to me that Jey Uso, he's the number three baby face in the company right now. I rank Jey Uso even above Seth Rollins. Jey Uso is the number three babyface in all of WWE. The only two people I would rank ahead of him right now are L.A. Knight and Cody Rhodes. I think it goes L.A. Knight, Cody Rhodes, Jey Uso. In that order. That's how popular he is right now. And apparently his merch is selling more than anybody else at the moment. I think he's, I think he's now topped even L.A. Knight. You know, with the, uh, the Jey Uso merch. Uh, I'm not counting Cena. 
just because you know he's a special attraction and he'll be gone soon so i'm not counting him uh but i don't see how you can argue that seth rollins is overall more popular than jay uso is right now i don't think you can speaking of jay uso we go backstage and he is in nick aldis's office along with uh, security guards and jay is telling security to stop and get off him Nick says that he's going to fine Jay $10,000 for what he did tonight. And I just laughed. What is he going to do? If Jay Uso does not pay the fine, what is Nick Aldis, the general manager of the show that he is not even on, going to do to him? You're the general manager of SmackDown. You're going to fine a Raw star $10,000. And what if he says no? Right? What then? Meanwhile, Jay's boss, the general manager of Raw, Adam Pierce, inexplicably was on SmackDown tonight. He was right there in the office with them. Was he aware of the fact that Jay Uso was coming to Raw? Did he did he give him his blessing to show up on the show and do what he did? Given what Jimmy did to him on Monday, that doesn't seem like a very wise decision for a general manager to be making. Two wrongs don't make a right. I learned that when I was four. So they never did really uh, bother to explain exactly why Adam Pierce was there. But he was there and he suggested, well, look, wait a minute now. If you're going to fine him $10,000, then you should do the same thing to Jimmy for what he did on Monday night. It's only the fair thing to do. So Aldis said that uh, the security guards, they need to escort Jay out of the building. And Pierce says, wait, wait, hold up, hold up. He says, I'll escort him out myself. And Aldis says that's a great idea, and he asks security to escort them both out of the building. And now Pierce gets serious, he takes the glasses off, and he says to Nick Aldis, are you kicking me out of the building? And Aldis gets up in his face and says, I am. And Adam Pierce hits him with, let the games begin. And they leave. The games, you say? The games! They weren't being very subtle about this. So that little tease right there makes you think that we're going to get brand warfare war games at Survivor Series. That this might be Raw versus SmackDown war games. Which I hate. I hate that idea. And I hope, I hope that that is not the idea for Survivor Series. Because... I am so over the brand warfare stuff. I was so happy to see it get junked last year. We got a reprieve from it. We've been doing the Raw versus SmackDown shit now for how many years has Vince McMahon been doing this for? Never bothered to treat the brand split with any level of seriousness. And yet we're supposed to care when we come to November and we get the red shirts and the blue shirts. Like, people are so loyal to one brand over the other, and it was even worse in past years because they always had the draft in October. So you'd have people being moved back and forth from one brand to the other. Somebody's on SmackDown who spent the whole year on Raw, but they got the blue shirt on, and it's like, well, I'm Team Blue now. It's like, who cares? The whole thing was just ass backwards, upside down. And so now they have installed general managers for the two shows, right? We have Adam Pearce representing Raw. We have Nick Aldis representing SmackDown. But it's way too soon. If that's the idea, maybe it isn't. But if that's the idea, way too soon to be jumping right into the brand warfare stuff. War games, if they're going to do a war games, and it sounds like they're doing one at least for the men this year, war games should be based upon... The stories that are currently going on at this moment. You have stories involving the bloodline, involving the Judgment Day. You have an alliance that was formed on this very television show only a few weeks ago. Between the Judgment Day and the bloodline that has not played at all. Has not played out at all on television in the week six. It's almost like it's just been completely forgotten about. Maybe it has been. Maybe with the creative change that recently took place. Maybe it is going to be forgotten about. I hope not. But when I look at what war games could be this year, what what the teams potentially uh, for war games could be, I look and I see I see the bloodline. I see members of the Judgment Day on one side. You can get five people that way, even without Roman Reigns. 
And then on the opposing side, you have Cody Rhodes, you have Jey Uso, you have LA Knight, you have maybe Sami Zayn, and you have an open spot for someone who looks like he's on his way back very soon to WWE, and he's got a bone to pick with the bloodline. Because the last time we saw him on television, he was being beaten down by the bloodline. It's been a year and a half. And guess who's on his way back? Probably by Survivor Series, Randy Orton. So that's how you put together a War Games match. You don't put it together based upon red versus blue, who's on the on the Monday roster, who's on the Friday roster. We just had Jimmy Uso show up on Monday. We had Jay Uso show up on Friday. Because it just it, it creates this weird situation then where if it's going to be brand versus brand, what do you, well where does LA Knight fit into this picture? Right? Because he's on SmackDown. So that that's going to be an interesting question now as we head into Survivor Series. If we get the War Games match, are they doing brand versus brand? Or are they going to do the right thing and create teams that actually make sense here? Because I just think it's way too soon to jump back feet first into this brand bullshit. You know, you just put these two guys in charge of these two shows. You got to give it time. Triple H now has a chance. This is his show now. For real, right? Or so we're told. He has the chance now to make this brand split feel like a real brand split. That takes time, though. A month is not long enough. So I'm excited to see what happens now with this whole Aldis versus Pierce thing. I think they can make it work. But I don't see how that works as far as the configuration of the team, unless you do like a wild card type match like they did back in 1995. Uh, I just don't see how that works. Logan Paul was back on SmackDown tonight. And he was out to the ring next. And he said that six days ago, he was in England beating the living daylights out of a scumbag. He was talking about uh, Dylan Dennis. He says that he won his fight. And he says to call it a fight was an insult to combat. He says if he wanted real competition, he could have another WWE match. He beat an internet troll, a man who hides behind the mask of the internet. Speaking of masks, he said, look, I'm not here to talk about Rey Mysterio. I'm really not. He says, I already beat Rey in my first WWE match. He says the last time he beat Rey, Dominic was still his son. The last time he faced Rey Mysterio, Roman Reigns actually showed up, and L.A. Knight did not even have a job. He says a lot has changed. He's an engaged man, and he has a multi-billion dollar hydration business. He's figured out his life, and he knows who he is. He says that I am a WWE superstar. He says he's not here for Rey, but Rey has something that Logan needs. He says Rey has respect. He says, I don't need your respect. Ray has legacy, but I have a legacy. He says what Ray has is the United States Championship, and that is what Logan needs. He says he beat up a deadbeat dad last week, and now he'll have to do it again at Crown Jewel. Well, he can't let this uh, Dylan Dennis thing go now, can he? Ray Mysterio's music hits. He makes his way out to the ring, and uh, he was wearing a, a black mask on with tiny ears. Looked like somebody put Christian Bale in the dryer. But he was in the ring. He tells Logan he reminds him of his son, Dominic. He says, amazing natural ability, dripping with passion, incredible career ahead of you, and a big mouth, just like Dom. He says Logan needs some humbling. The last time he knocked some sense into Dominic, he was a little reluctant. But with Logan, he says he's not going to hesitate to whoop his ass. Mysterio mentions that Logan wants the title, that he needs the title. Logan says yes. Actually, he said C. Ray tells Logan that he's going to give him the opportunity, and he accepts his challenge for Crown Jewel. And Logan wishes him luck. He offers his hand to Ray. Ray looks around like he's, he's waiting for something. He doesn't trust this guy, but ultimately he does shake hands with him, and Logan leaves without incident. So that was it. There was no big twist at the end. They they had their little back and forth, which really wasn't anything special, but they shook hands, and now the match is official. So at Crown Jewel, Logan Paul uh, will get 
Only his second championship opportunity in WWE. His first one was a year ago in Saudi Arabia against Roman Reigns. And they actually had an excellent match. He lost. Didn't work out for him. Now he's going after the United States Championship. The idea of Logan Paul challenging, all of a sudden being obsessed with wanting to be the United States Champion. It does kind of feel like it came out of nowhere. You can make sense out of it. Uh, it is believable because, as he pointed out, his very first match in WWE was against Rey Mysterio. It was against Rey and Dominic. It was a tag team match. And he won. He and Miz won that match. So he technically has a win over Rey Mysterio. Now he sees that Rey Mysterio is a champion. Well, he wants to be a champion. And he looks at Rey, who's half his size, and he figures this is going to be a cakewalk. Right? I can finally hold some gold here in WWE. So I can believe, I can, you know, believable premise, I think, for the match. I can get behind that. I actually think Logan Paul would make a fine United States champion under one condition. And this is a big caveat here to what I'm about to say. Logan Paul can be the United States champion, but if he's going to be the champion, he needs to be on the show more often. SmackDown can ill afford to have two absentee champions at the same time. We barely get to see Roman Reigns. He has had a stranglehold over the top title in this company now for three years. And that stranglehold is going to continue well into 2024. He's here one week, he's gone the next three. You cannot then take your secondary championship on the show, which is what everybody else is left to fight for, put it on somebody, on a part time celebrity who's only going to be on the show once every blue moon. You can't do that. There's no point in even having a United States championship if that's what you're going to do with it. So if he's going to make the commitment to be on the show more often and maybe even wrestle some TV matches every now and then, it's an idea that I can get behind. He would have to avail himself, though, to the company more often because I just cannot support the idea of having two absentee champions on the same show at the same time. It, it's just insanity if that's what they plan on doing. Uh, if he wins it, though, I will say, if he wins it, it does give LA Knight something to do heading into WrestleMania season. Because, as I said, LA Knight is not walking out of Riyadh as the WWE champion. And so, as I was thinking, okay, what do you do with LA Knight then, right? He's not going to wrestle for the title at WrestleMania. I saw, I think, on one of the betting sites, apparently he's one of the favorites to win the Royal Rumble match next year. I don't think he will. Yeah, he already won the Battle Royal. He won the Slim Jim Battle Royal at Summer. <coughs> excuse me, at SummerSlam. He's not winning the Royal Rumble. But what do you do with him, right? And I think we were even talking about this several months ago about potential matches for for LA Knight at WrestleMania. And Logan Paul was one of the people that I was talking about who was on the list. Now I didn't have the the thought necessarily of it being for the U.S. title at the time, uh, but at least that would give some something for him to challenge for. So. Yeah, could I see Logan Paul leaving Crown Jewel with the championship? Yes, I can. And taking it all the way to WrestleMania and defending the title there. You know, whether it's against Knight or or somebody else. Uh, I could definitely see that. But where does that leave Santos Escobar, though? Right? If Logan Paul wins this championship from Rey Mysterio, I would like to know where that leaves Escobar. It looked to me like when Ray said he was going to go out there and do this on his own, Escobar looked a little frustrated. And, you know, we've a lot of us have been waiting to see when are they going to do this turn. It just seemed like this was going to be an inevitable thing, that there was going to be some sort of falling out between him and Escobar, and it was going to lead to a, a feud between the two. And it looks like they still may be on that path. It may not be for the United States Championship. You know, here I thought that ultimately the title would end up around Escobar's waist. Maybe it won't. You know, maybe maybe the trigger for the fallout between them is Ray losing the title at Crown Jewel. So I'm I'm curious to see what they end up doing with Escobar and if this sort of sidetracks him in some way, uh, which would be a shame. You know, now Carlito is back. He's part of the LWO. You know, does this end with LWO going heel and Ray getting bounced out of the group? I mean, this is few different ways they could go with this. Uh, you could have Carlito eventually be the one to, to do a turn. And he leads the LWO, you know, instead of Ray. He probably should go heel with that music. 
he's not going to change his music back, he may as well go heel. We had Dragon Lee and Cameron Grimes against Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. They took a break very early into this match. When they came back, Waller was working over Lee. Theory tagged in. Lee, though, landed a DDT on both heels. He got the hot tag from Cameron Grimes. Grimes hit a crossbody on Waller. Then he got a German suplex on Theory for a two count. Waller went to the outside. Lee hit a huge dive out to the floor. Inside, Grimes lifted Theory. Theory, though, raked the eyes to break it up. Waller ran into the ring just as Grimes was rolling up Theory and had the two count. And at that moment, here comes Waller with the rolling stunner into the ring. He hits the move. Theory then picks him up, eight town down, and he pins Cameron Grimes for the win. Austin Theory and Grayson Waller, they, they have found a chemistry working together uh, as we... As the company tries to figure out what to do now with Austin Theory, I think this is the best thing for him at the moment because Theory and Waller could be contenders for the tag team titles very soon. So they should have won this match. You know, them winning makes sense. Um, but this is where I realized, you know, we were 90 minutes into the show and we had about 14 minutes of wrestling on this show. And... Again, even though I, I enjoyed the show overall and it was moving along well, again, you can't, you can't do less than 15 minutes of actual action on a show called SmackDown when you're 90 minutes into the show. It's just ridiculous. That's like something you would see under Vince McMahon. I'm not going to give Triple H a pass for that. Kathy Kelly sat down for an interview in the empty arena stands earlier in the day with SmackDown's newest recruit. He got traded to SmackDown last week, Kevin Owens. And he said that he is uh, disappointed to be separated from Sami Zayn, especially after not getting a rematch that they deserve for the tag team titles. Uh, but, and actually they got a rematch, but I think he just meant a fair shot, really, at getting their belts back. They've been dealing with the Judgment Day, and so that's what he found disappointing, but he's excited to be on SmackDown. It's just bittersweet for him. He said, obviously, he's got a lot of history with the Bloodline, and he said him wearing a Yokozuna shirt was purely a coincidence. He was, in fact, wearing a, a Yokozuna shirt. He said he's never had a singles match with Rey Mysterio, which is something he has to do before his career is over. Same thing with Sheamus. He said, uh, Raw... SmackDown, it doesn't matter. All he tries to do is make sure people go home and they know that it was the Kevin Owens show. That was it. Very simple promo. There was no real tease of anything specific. He was also mocking uh, Waller and Theory. Um, I think I said last week, somebody asked me, who do I think is a, a good first opponent for Owens? And I thought Grayson Waller would make sense because, again, it's somebody that Owens has not worked with before. Uh, Waller is doing the tag team thing now with Theory, but that doesn't mean that, you know, he can't have a little program with him. So I still stand by that. I, I look at who is going to be next for Kevin Owens. And there is no obvious opponent for him at the moment. You know, Bobby Lashley and Carlito, it looks like that's going to be something. So maybe, maybe it is Owens and Waller, you know, we'll see. But our main event of the evening was for the WWE Women's Championship. It was Io Sky defending her title against the former champion many times over, Charlotte Flair. Charlotte attempted to apply the figure eight almost immediately, and uh, they very quickly went to a commercial break. Charlotte was in control when they came back. She landed some chops and sent Io into the corner. Bailey grabbed Charlotte's leg, and Io knocked her to the floor. She followed with a suicide dive outside. Charlotte eventually made a comeback and landed a back suplex. Both women got tied up in the ropes, and Io dumped Charlotte to the floor. And then Io attempted a Hurricane Rana from the apron to the floor. She jumped off, and she got about halfway through. Charlotte held her, and then she muscled her up into a powerbomb position, and then she dumped Io face first onto the ring apron, heading into another commercial break, second break of the match. Thankfully, that was the final one. They come back. Both women are fighting on the top rope. And that led to a sit-out powerbomb. 
kind of an avalanche uh, sit out power bomb by EO. And Charlotte landed hard too on that power bomb. But she did kick out at two. EO got the double knees in the corner and then worked a cross face, but Charlotte got up immediately and hit a German suplex. She followed that up with a fallaway slam and then a second fallaway slam for a near fall. EO was on the apron. She went for a springboard drop kick. Charlotte, though, caught her, put her in a Boston Crab. EO rolled through, got a two count. EO got Charlotte down, and then she went for her finish. She went to the top rope. She was trying for the over the moonsault, but Charlotte got her feet up and boy did she ever. She she caught her right in the might have been the sh a little bit of the shoulder too, but it looked like she got her right in the face and EO took this great bump halfway across the ring. You know, so many times we see that where somebody will come off the top rope, they'll get the feet to the face, and it doesn't even really look all that good. And you got to be careful, right? Because you don't want to knock the other person's teeth out of their mouth. They hit this perfectly. And like I said, EO went flying halfway across the ring. Then Charlotte cut her in half with a spear. She had the match won. She went to go pin EO. Bailey, though, placed EO's foot on the bottom rope for the rope break. And at this point now, Charlotte is sitting there and she looks like she's about to snap. And that is exactly what she does. And she goes outside. She starts beating up Bailey. She ends up throwing Bailey over the announce desk. Charlotte gets back in the ring. She's getting ready to go for another spear. And Dakota Kai is on the apron. She's got the referee distracted. In comes Charlotte for the spear, and she hits it. The only problem is she also hit the championship because EO had the women's title. She was holding it. So when Charlotte came in for the spear, she knocked herself out. And EO covered her, and the referee turned around and made the pin, and EO Sky retains the championship. I love this. I really love the finish. It, 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 you were wondering, what did it remind me of? It reminded me of the Bret Hart Goldberg spot. Not, not done as well, obviously, but the Bret Hart Goldberg spot from their segment in WCW on Nitro, where in comes Goldberg for the spear, and he gets knocked out. And then we find out that Brett had a metal plate. So I like that. And I like the fact that EO retained her championship because I was worried they were going to take the title off of her tonight. Thankfully, they didn't do that. After the match, Damage Control attacks Charlotte when Bianca Belair makes her big return. First time that we have seen Bianca on TV since mid-August. Last time we saw her, she was uh, getting attacked. Her injured leg was being attacked backstage by Damage Control. So she ran down to the ring to go after Bailey and EO, since Dakota is still off limits. She's not yet medically cleared. She had EO up for the KOD, but Bailey saved her, so she gave Bailey the KOD instead. And then Bianca went over to the corner. She helped Charlotte to her feet, and that is how they went off the air with the two of them in the ring standing tall. Charlotte at the very end there even looked like she was kind of uh, bopping there a little bit to Bianca's music. Bianca, Bianca's music is pretty good. Bianca's music is a little bit of a banger. I like her music a hell of a lot more than I like Carlito's music. I'll say, I'll say that much. A very good main event. Very good main event. They gave them about 15 minutes. Uh, again, still doesn't make up for the overall lack of wrestling that we had on the show tonight. But we got a strong match. EO actually winning, even if by nefarious means. She did pick up the win. And it is good to see Bianca Belair back. Of course, her other half is now a heel. Montez Ford is now a heel, which he was not the last time we saw Bianca Belair on TV. And I don't believe we're going to have to wait much longer for her to join him. Now, I don't mean literally join him, like she's going to join Bobby Lashley's faction. But I, I don't think it's going to be very long before we see her make her way to the dark side. Because we are heading into WrestleMania season. And the way that I see things shaking out is this. I still feel the same way that I felt earlier in the year. When I talked about the WrestleMania match next year, beating Charlotte Flair and Bianca Belair. So now Bianca is back, standing shoulder to shoulder at the end of the show tonight with Charlotte Flair. And how we get there is this. We're probably going to get a tag team match now. 
going to get Charlotte Flair and Bianca Belair as tag team partners against Damage Control. Possibly a crown jewel. I could see Bianca and Charlotte against Io and Bailey. And Charlotte and Bianca are going to win. Now, Charlotte Flair got a rematch tonight because Adam Pearce agreed that she was screwed at Fastlane and she deserved a championship. Well, Charlotte got screwed again tonight. So after her and Bianca win, it only makes sense that she would get another championship match because, again, it's Charlotte Flair, and she always has her Charlotte in the bank. So she's going to get another title match. And when Charlotte gets that next title match, I believe she will win, and she will become a 15-time women's champion. And when she does, that is when Bianca Belair will turn on Charlotte Flair. And then we will have a Bianca and a Charlotte program taking us all the way to WrestleMania. Now, we may get a match between them before then, maybe at the Royal Rumble, but the match at WrestleMania, I still believe, is going to be Charlotte Flair and Bianca Belair for the Women's Championship, and very likely, Charlotte going in as the champion and dropping the belt to Bianca. And that is how I see things going. Now, I say Bianca is the heel. Who knows, right? The, the fans may boo Charlotte and cheer Bianca, but that is how I see this playing out. Now that we are getting very close to WrestleMania, Bianca is back. That is how I see things playing out. I still think we get to the same destination. So, well, yes, Nick Aldis, the, the Juliet says it was Nick Aldis that gave her the rematch. I stand correct. I thought it was Adam Pearce. I thought that was like Adam Pierce's last act on SmackDown, but yes, it was it was Nick Aldis. The point is, she got her rematch, she got screwed again, you know she's getting another one. And this time when she gets the next match, it's going to be a situation where Bailey and Dakota are either banned from ringside, or they're not, but Charlotte has Bianca in her corner to watch her back. But the end result, I think, is going to be the same. Charlotte Flair gets the belt. Pads her record. She gets to 15. It brings her one step closer to 16, which brings her one step closer to breaking her father's record. And we get Charlotte and Bianca. Same same destination. But as far as the show overall, I enjoyed it. Again, I thought it was a good show. Uh, next week, they're going to be on FS1. They're being bumped. And Roman Reigns will be back. We'll get our contract signing with him in LA Knight. Uh, that is on the show next week. Let us take a look at the poll for tonight's show. 81%. Look at this. 81% thumbs up. Very strong score. 18% thumbs down. With uh, just shy of 500 votes in so far. What is Damage Control then going to do at WrestleMania? Well, we'll finally get that Bailey and EO match. Right? Da damage Control is not going to be together forever. So WrestleMania may well be EO Sky against Bailey, or it could be a triple threat match, because by then I would think uh, Dakota Kai probably would be cleared by then, right? I think there was talk maybe that she could potentially be cleared around Royal Rumble time. Uh, even if she misses the Rumble, I would have to think that by April, Dakota's going to already be back in the ring by then. So you could, have a, you could have a triple threat match between all three members of Damage Control come WrestleMania. And then they finally go their separate ways. So that could be the match. See, we're almost there, man. We're getting we're getting into WrestleMania season here. We're getting very close. Five hundred votes, only three hundred and thirty likes. I don't know, man. It's not looking good for be the Booker tonight. But let's. Uh... Get to your super chats here. Thank you for all of the support. Let's see what you thought about SmackDown. Uh, Fire Panda. Still uh, scrolling through the tales of the ancient texts. Sala Monster once scouted by the Reds and the Yankees. However, a knee injury forced him to retire from baseball. That's that knee injury from five years ago. Thank you, Fire Panda. Miles Woods. Does Becky having the NXT Women's Championship show that they need a mid-card women's title? Also, uh, they should have a TV title for the lower to mid-card. 
Uh, no, television title is absolutely not necessary. But I have talked about the possibility of, of a women's mid-card title. I just think you don't need that and the women's tag team titles because they don't really have a tag team division. I think you have one or the other. I don't, I don't see the need for both. If they junk the tag belts, I would be in favor of a women's intercontinental title. Uh, but with the women's tag team belts and they're trying to create stories for that division, I don't see the need for both. Uh, Trey with the 499 taking my nephews to their first wrestling show tonight. That's right. I think Trey was at SmackDown. Sold out. Legitimately sold out. I think they had about 14,000 people in the building tonight. 14 or 15,000. Uh, Booba with the 499. I was watching Halloween Havoc 1997 earlier today. That Eddie Guerrero Rey Mysterio match was great. Uh, what is your favorite Halloween Havoc? Oh. Favorite Halloween Havoc. I, I, I'm partial a little bit to 1993 uh, because 93 had this great Texas death match in the main event between Vader and Cactus Jack. Um, and I think there was also a, um, a Ric Flair, Rick Rude title match on that show. That was uh, pretty good. But the best Halloween Havoc I think ever, I think would have to be 1997. I think the one that you watched. I think 97 is the best. 97 had that classic match between Eddie and Ray, but the 97 show also had an excellent match between Macho Man Randy Savage and Diamond Dallas Page. It was some sort of Las Vegas death match or something like that, but Savage and DDP had a great match on that show, and Eddie and Ray had an all-time classic. So for those two matches alone, I think I go in 97. Now, the, the main event was Age in a Cage between Hogan and Piper. That was not good. And what I remember about that is the cage. The cage was like 30 feet tall. I don't know who made this cage. It was basically done in the style of the old WWF blue bar cages, only I don't know what it was made of. It was made of silly putty, I guess. But this cage had to be 30 feet tall. And then Savage comes back out at the very end. Well, I mean, one of the, one of the most unbelievable spots you will ever see and most painful looking spots that you will ever see savage climbs the cage and again this was a very very high cage and he jumps off the top of the cage he's going for like a double axe handle hogan's holding piper down below and savage as he is jumping from the top of the cage the cage bends it bends the top of the cage bends outward so that was very scary. Savage, who's already in his mid 40s at least at that point, comes all the way down and lands right on his knees. And I think he blew out both knees, at least one of his knees. If not both knees, he blew out. Meanwhile, Piper was supposed to move. He was supposed to hit Hogan. Piper barely moved. Hogan just stood there. So it was all for nothing anyway, because it looked like Savage didn't even, he hit Hogan with a glancing blow. But I will never forget that spot. I mean, my knees hurt just watching that. I can only imagine what that felt like. And I'm pretty sure Savage after that, I don't think we saw him again for months. I mean, seriously, go back and watch when he dives off the top of that cage, how it bends. I don't know where WCW found the people who made this rickety piece of crap. Thankfully, they never used that cage again. Holy shit. 98 had that great match with Goldberg and DDP, but uh, 97 would get my vote for the best Halloween habit. Uh, Base Beerus, God of Seduction. Tonight we saw the debut of Ninja Uso. I like how you put Ninja in parentheses, so I knew what you meant by that. Uh, Jamie Dorsch, thank you for the 20. Jamie, thank you very much. Could we see a double turn at Crown Jewel? with Drew and Damian Priest. Drew wins against Rollins with the Judgment Day's help, and then Damian Priest cashes in only for the Judgment Day to turn on him, and Drew McIntyre then joins. I just don't see Drew McIntyre being a good fit for the Judgment. I don't know that he needs the Judgment. That's the only part of that that I just can't really, can't really see that. 
But I do think Drew needs to lose in order for, for his heel turn to be complete. I think he needs to lose this championship match, and that's what sort of is the ultimate catalyst for this, uh, this heel turn or him snapping. So I think that's what has to happen at Crown Jewel. I just, I don't see him in the judgment. I don't see that being a good mix. Uh, Rob G, ever said World Wrestling Entertainment Champion? Never, not once in my entire life, and I never will. The Real CSO 2 with WWE adding new sets for Survivor Series and with them having a smaller stage set up, does that make War Games less likely? No, I don't think so. They are talking about adding new sections to the show and possibly downsizing the, the, the stage. But, you know, they, they would just maybe have something similar to what they had in Puerto Rico for Backlash, which was a, a more minimalist set. See, I, I like it when you actually could see the fans behind the entrance stage when people come out, uh, when it's more filled in that way. Uh, I'm always a big advocate for putting as many people in the building as you possibly can. Um, but I don't think it makes war games any less likely. Yeah, just because of the two rings? I, I don't think so. I think they could still make it work. Uh, Groovy Goose. You know, that is an interesting point, though. When they first announced Survivor Series last year, War Games was announced. And it was part of the advertising. I think we already knew when tickets went on sale that there was going to be a War Games match, which means on the seating map, they would have already had the two rings accounted for. Survivor Series is already sold out. Um, if they're going to have two rings... That's a good question. That is a good question. How do they how do they account for that? I assume that uh, on the seating map it didn't show two rings. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I still think we're getting a war games, but that that's an interesting point. I don't know. Uh, Groovy Goose, how would you rate a program between current Bloodline Roman Reigns and The Undertaker? Would you have been okay with that ending the streak if not for Brock? Uh, I've said before I was not in favor of the streak ending, but if you told me the streak is ending, it's a done deal, whether you like it or not, it's just a matter of picking who is the guy to do it, then yes, I would have picked Roman Reigns. This, this tribal chief version of Roman Reigns, who let's say at the time was not champion yet, he was on the ascent, uh, Roman Reigns over, over Brock Lesnar would have made a lot more sense. Absolutely. Uh, Andre Johnson with the 999. If you could set up the War Games matches for Survivor Series, how would you book it? Uh, do you think a returning Randy Orton could be involved? Keep up the good work. Love listening to you every week. Thank you, Andre. Yes, I do think Randy Orton is coming back, and I it's what I said before. I think you have members of the Bloodline paired up with members of the Judgment Day, uh, whether that's Roman, Jimmy solo balor and priest or jimmy solo balor priest and dominic and on the opposing sides you have cody you have jay you have la knight you have maybe Sami Zayn, and you have the returning randy orton and that's how you get your five on five there's your there's your war game event. uh boots Says, uh, it may be the booze talking, but I'm re-watching Lucha Underground, and I'm wondering why Tony Khan has not brought the mini wrestlers to AEW as a fun-sized showcase. Well, I mean, he maybe Tony Khan is not a fan of the, uh, of the minis. I don't know, he was promising a dream match tonight. Can somebody uh, update me here in the chat on the, uh, let me see. Because he was promising the announcement of some kind of a dream match for Collision tomorrow night. That uh, he was going to announce on Rampage. And the match... Okay, well, apparently it's Brian Danielson. Is that the match? Brian Danielson against Andrade? You see, uh, this, is, this is the problem. When you have... Some, and Tony Khan loves doing this. He loves he loves throwing the word dream match around for everything. Andrade and Danielson is going to be a fantastic match. 
that's not a dream match. I'll probably have a couple people go, oh, it's a dream match for me. Like, he throws these words around until they just don't mean anything at all. It's a great match, but is Andrade and Brian Danielson a dream match? No, I'm sorry, it's not. That's the dream match that he was promoting. Yeah, whatever. That, that's going to be a great wrestling match. I wouldn't call it a dream match. My God. My God. Everything is a dream match these days. Everything is a dream match. I, I don't understand. I just don't get it. Uh, Chris Miner with the 15 bucks. Got a raise at work today and wanted to celebrate that by sending this super chat in. Well, very nice of you. Thank you. And congratulations. Keep up the great work and thank you for being the most level-headed wrestling show. I try. I do my best. Paul Carpenter. Adam. Adam. Tony has a gift for Sting. That's right. Tony Khan is going to have a gift for Sting. On Dynamite on Wednesday. Maybe it will be a dream match. Maybe Tony Khan is going to finally get Sting that match with The Undertaker that he's always wanted. Maybe Tony Khan has worked a little something out behind the scenes. He's going to get The Undertaker out of retirement as Mean Mark. And we're going to get the match at Revolution next year. Sting and The Undertaker. There's a dream match for you. Right? Look, about 20 years too late. Maybe that's his gift for Sting. Uh, the Real CS says, if Vince never left last year, how long would it have been before LA Knight got future Endeavor? Uh, he'd be gone already. That wave of, of releases that we just got a couple months ago, he would have been gone. Now, a doubt in my mind, he would already be out of the company. As soon as that gimmick failed, the maximum male models, as soon as that ran its course, and it did very quickly, that's it. He would have been floundering around, the Endeavor deal goes through. They get rid of a bunch of people. He'd be he'd be at home right now waiting for his non-compete to expire, and then he'd probably end up in AEW. Guaranteed. Annis with the 499. Is CM Punk still coming to WWE? Now since Endeavor took over, Vince being gone, maybe Endeavor is thinking big money, and they don't care about drama. What, what are your thoughts? I don't think CM Punk is coming to WWE. Endeavor can do whatever they want. So yeah, if they want CM Punk, they'll get CM Punk. I'm sure Punk would love to come. I'm sure he'd, he'd take the money, he'd love to come in. But uh, all this talk about Chicago and Survivor Series, uh, keeping it hush-hush, no, I, I don't think he's coming in. Paul Carpenter, the almighty prophets need new music and a new entrance i agree yes they do d block 85 my first time super chat is solely to acknowledge your hell in a cell 2019 rant four years ago ran it back this afternoon and nearly pissed my pants with laughter well i'm glad that some people can at least be entertained by my misery in having to watch that main event and watch that show Though, as I recall, I think the opening match of that show, was that the Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks, Hell in a Cell? Because that was an excellent match. But uh, I'm glad that you can enjoy through my suffering. Psycho Jet Black with the two bucks. Uh, why do you hate fans singing Rollins theme song? Because it's annoying. I think it's annoying. That's why run its course. I don't like it. Other people do. So let them have their fun. Doesn't mean I have to like it. I think it's stupid. DEH Sires, do you see Punk in WWE in 2024? I think there's a better chance of him being in WWE in 2024 than there is at the end of 2023. Do I see him in WWE? I don't. Arabian Night. Heel Santos and Carlito against Ray and Bad Bunny at Survivor Series or Royal Rumble. Now, that's if they do that, that's a WrestleMania match. Bad Bunny is not coming. I don't think Bad Bunny is not coming back for a uh, Survivor Series match. If anything, it would be a WrestleMania match. 
Uh, DEH says SmackDown needs more in-ring work, guys. They are lacking. Uh, Arabian Night, do you think they're holding off Cross right now for a feud with Owens or something with him and Uncle Howdy? I want him to succeed and still think that he can. I think Uncle Howdy is is done. Uncle Howdy was that was going to be part of the whole Bray thing, and that's that's done now. That's not happening. So Uncle Howdy is done. Cross and Owens could be could be something. That's true. I almost forgot about Cross to be honest with you. Uh, Cross and Owens, I don't think they've ever worked together before. So yeah, that could be a feud for Owens. I don't know if it would be his first one, uh, but that might make sense. I think Triple H is going to keep trying with Cross. I think he likes Cross. Um, I mean, look, I like Cross. You know, I, I want to see the guy succeed, but again, this run has been a bust. And I think even as a Cross fan, you have to admit this run has been a complete bust. But Triple H likes him. He's going to keep trying with him. And, you know, maybe a feud with Owens will do more good for Cross than it would for Owens even. Uh, the Real CS02. I can't believe Impact Wrestling reportedly offered CM Punk a contract. No offense, but impact afford him well they made him uh whatever deal they could afford and now it's up to him whether he wants to accept that deal or not look i could see punk making an appearance at impact do i see him signing a contract with impact no no because they can't afford it would he show up though to make an appearance and get people buzzing of course and Impact would welcome him with open arms, even if it was for one night. If he was sitting in the crowd, are you kidding me? They would love it. Scott Demore would love it. He'd put him on TV in a heartbeat. Is he going to sign a contract with Impact? I can't imagine. And, uh, oh, he, he sent a second super chat in to say can't. He meant can't. I, I kind of surmise that's what you mean. Hey, look at Zizu dropping a gifted membership to uh, J Rich Flow. So, J Rich Flow, you are now a channel member. You can thank Zizu for that. Zizu, thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, so now at least we know what this uh, supposed dream match is tomorrow night. Now the goal tonight was 415, and uh, we are currently at 411. So tisk tisk tisk, a very slow night, very slow night all around. I don't know, man. I don't know. I think it was just a slow night, a slow week. As I'm going through my notes in preparation for the podcast on Sunday, it's just kind of been a slow week. But in any event, uh, the next time I'm going to be live with you uh, will be Monday night. We'll be talking about Monday Night Raw. So that is coming up on Monday. Of course, Sunday is episode 831 of the podcast. If you got mailbag questions, now would be a good time to email me and get them on in. Uh, I may try to get to some of those. Of course, we'll talk about Sting. Got a lot to say about him and his career and his upcoming retirement. Uh, got some thoughts on MJF and Kenny Omega. And when we might quite possibly be getting a match between the two of them. News on the NWA. Now that we know what television station they are actually going to. Talked about that last week, and sure enough, they're headed to one of the networks that I mentioned. So uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, Jerry the King Lawler gave his first interview this week, ever since his uh, big stroke back in February with Bill After, which I listened to. I watched the uh, video. He wasn't on video for it. Uh, After was, but uh, I listened to that. So uh, that'll be coming up on uh, Sunday. And it looks like we have indeed made the goal. Have we made the goal? I think we have. Let's take a look and see. The goal has been met. The goal has been met for Be The Booker. So, boy, you, you guys, you guys, man, I don't know. I don't know. All you late bloomers out there. All right, let's Be The Booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the Booker. I don't know why you wait until the last minute like that. Zizu with another gifted membership to D Block 85. Welcome, D Block. D Block is excited for Be the Booker. As am I. 
I didn't think we were going to make it to that. All right, well, let's see here. We uh, begin. Well, how, how's that for a kickoff here to be the booker? Middle-aged and crazy. I think he was born middle-aged. I, th I think Terry Funk came out of the womb looking like this. Terry Funk. Who, unfortunately, we lost this year. Terry Funk here making uh, what may be his Be the Booker debut. I'm trying to think if we've if we've landed on him before. I don't think we have. Terry Funk going one-on-one -on -one with Hollywood Hulk Hogan. Hey, Tony Khan, there's a dream match. There you go. Last time I saw Hulk Hogan against Terry Funk, I think it was on Saturday night's main event, probably, in 85. My God. Hulk Hogan and Terry Funk. That is how you kick off Be the Booker. That's how you do it. You hear that, Tony? You hear that, Tony Khan? That's a real dream match right there. All right, on the women's side, we begin with Nikita Lyons. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This, this chat is going to explode, among other things. Nikita Lyons, who has been out for quite a while, I think with a uh, torn ACL. But uh, there you go. Let us admire. This was, uh, this was Nikita Lyons in action in NXT. I believe this was her, <laughs> her finishing maneuver here. I can't really tell. I'm trying to see if I can figure out who's underneath. I'm trying to study this here. I can't really tell who that is. But uh, anyway, there you go. Nikita Lyons. Should we? Oh, we should move on. Yes, we probably should. Okay. Nikita Lyons. Let's look at this. The numbers actually went up with her on screen. I just keep a picture of her up on screen for the next 20 minutes. Uh, Nikita Lyons against... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Becky, look at her butt. It is so big. It is Brie Bella. Everybody, Nikita Lyons and Brie Mode in Be the Booker. Well, try, try again. Try again. Brie TSD in full effect. Brie TSD, Paul London, and Brian Kendrick, former SmackDown Tag Team Champions. <laughs> this, this woman is destroying Be The Booker. I don't think I've landed on any in the women's portion of this, I don't think I have landed on anybody as many times as Brie Bella. It's, it's just the power, I guess, the power of Brie mode. I don't know what else to say. Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Taking on Ray and Dominic Mysterio. Look at look at young Dom. This is before he was corrupted by Rhea Ripley. He was just a boy. Ray and Dom. Hey man, you get Ray in the ring with Paul London. That's enough for the bell right there. Just those two in the ring alone. Man, remove her. I'm not removing her. I'm not removing her. She's part of the. She's part of the roster. She's you know she was a woman. She's a former champion, right? Who uh, was she a champion? I don't even know now. I, don't, I know Nikki was, but nonetheless, I mean she was on the roster and she belongs in there. It's just that it's ridiculous that we keep landing on her. I can't explain it. Uh, an Arabian Knight. Dropping a uh, $2 super chat here. Bailey and Osprey bound for glory will be one of your match of the year candidates on my list 100%. It may be. I mean, that sounds like a hell of a match. That's uh, bound for glory tomorrow night. Mike Tanay and Don West, the late Don West, being inducted into the Impact Hall of Fame. 
I think this is the first time we're going to see Mike Tenay on a wrestling television show in many, many years. Will Ospreay is wrestling speedball Mike Bailey. I believe it's... Um, is it Josh Alexander uh, in the main event against Alex Shelley, I believe, right, for the Impact World Championship? I mean, it looks like a solid card. So uh, those of you who are interested, that is tomorrow night. Of course, Collision is tomorrow night as well. Groovy Goose, just call it Breathe the Booker at this point. You know what? I think I may have to. <laughs> that might be the best super chat all night. Breathe the Booker? I, you know what? I think you're right. That is going to have to be the name from now on. We're going to have to call it Breathe the Booker. Yes, and Chris Sabin takes on Kenta. That is also on the card tomorrow night. How do you watch? Uh, well, it should be on traditional pay-per-view. Right? And unless it's on fight, I think it should be on traditional pay-per-view. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for Bree the Booker. You hear that, Noah? Are you listening? Uh, where do you watch TNA Wrestling? People watch it on uh, Access. It's on Access TV. Bash is surprised that Mike Tenay did not go over to AEW. Yeah, he just wanted he just wanted to be done. He hasn't done much. Uh, occasionally, he'll pop up when there's a, a passing of a certain wrestler. Uh, he might, you know, call into Observer Radio with uh, with Meltzer and do uh, like an audio show. But otherwise, you don't really hear much from him these days. He's he's doing well, you know. But I guess he just didn't want the gig. You know, and I meant to mention this also about um, Collision. On last week's show, Tony Schiavone was the play-by-play -play guy. And he talked about it on his podcast that he went to Tony Khan recently and said he wants another shot at play-by-play. -play. And he thought maybe he would get the gig on, on, um, on Rampage. And then Tony told him it was going to be on Collision. And he was, he was right there in the middle last week. And he was flanked on either side by Kevin Kelly and, and uh, Nigel McGuinness. So it looks like Kevin Kelly may have been replaced as the play-by-play -play voice. He's still on the show, but he's effectively been replaced, it looks like, by Tony Schiavone, which is very interesting. Because we haven't had Tony Schiavone calling play-by-play. -play. Uh, well, I mean, I guess he did for MLW there for a while, but... Yeah, if you go back to the WCW days when he was the, the primary play-by-play -play voice, it's been a very long time. And apparently he wanted another shot at it. And so Tony Khan gave it to him. So we'll see tomorrow night if it's the same thing. If they go on the air and, and Tony is in the middle, then I guess he's the new play-by-play -play guy officially. Uh, Tay Tay the Savior. Who would pay to see Nikita versus Bree? No one. That's why I hit the buzzer. I don't know why people are so upset about that. Did you honestly expect that to get the bell? And, uh, oh, it's Fawaz. He says, hey, man, what's up? You are amazing as always. And there I see those emojis. Fawaz has got something planned. Fawaz has something planned for Crown Jewel. I don't know what it is. He's been dropping CM Punk gifts on me, best in the world. I think I'm I'm starting to see a theme for his sign for this show. I don't know. Fawaz, for those who don't know, he he's front and center on all these Saudi Arabia shows. Like front row, third row, hard camera, always representing the sound off worldwide. I love it. I appreciate it. And I always think to myself, how could he top himself? We've gotten some amazing shots of that sound off sign behind Roman Reigns and behind all these people. So he's he's planning something. So for that reason alone, you've got to tune into Crown Jewel. I, I got to see what Fawaz has up his sleeve here. But uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. All right, that about wraps it up. I think we covered all the key stuff to cover. Not a lot of wrestling on the show tonight, but I enjoyed SmackDown on the whole. 
Speaking of holes, I'm going to take that money out of Naya's hole that I uh, stuffed in there earlier on. Alex Shelley finally getting his respect, says Miguel. Yeah, he's, he's getting a good, solid singles run for himself. You know, we've had him in House of Glory, and you could see the respect, you know, that the people, uh, the younger members of the roster had for him. They were very excited. You know, we when we brought in the uh, the Motor City Machine Guns earlier this year for a tag team match, everybody was, oh, the Machine Guns are coming in, you know. He's been around for a long time. He's very well respected. He's a great wrestler, and I'm happy to see him getting, you know, his flowers as a single star. You know, good for him. And <laughs> Justin says he's literally only tuning in to Crown Jewel to see what Fawaz does. Fawaz is the draw, not LA Knight. Well, we'll see. Tune in, I guess, right, to find out. Only two weeks away. Yeah, I'll have to go check out that Mystico match with uh, Rocky Romero that I heard good things about from Rampage tonight. We'll go check that out. All right, episode 831 of The Sound Off on Sunday. Please go ahead and make sure you check that out and download it when it drops on Sunday afternoon. And then right back here on the YouTube channel for live Monday Night Raw coverage coming up on uh, Monday. We'll kick off a brand new week. So thank you for all the support. Be well. Stay safe. Have yourselves a great weekend. And uh, we'll do it all over again next week right here on YouTube. Take care, guys.